In my hands, I hold the key to getting better at architecture. The best architecture competition submissions of 2020. With explanations of how they won and extra interviews with incredible architects who are absolutely killing it. Let's explore what these guys did to create projects that won global competitions. They have to be doing something right, so let's find out what that is. is the architecture competitions yearbook for 2020. It's the second volume of the publication. Last year we reviewed the 2019 volume which we actually gave away a few copies over on the Instagram page and the YouTube channel and we're going to be doing that again this year. If you want to win a free copy of this book stick around because a bit later I'll be explaining how you can go about having a copy of this sent to your door for free. Well grab yourself some thinking juice and perhaps a snack because we're going to be digging deep into this book to find out how you can evolve your own projects in to potential competition winners. Let's dig into it. So, I'm just gonna start flicking through. So I'm just gonna quickly read a snippet of the editorial by Marson, who is the founder of competitions.archy who created this book. He says, the main focus of this edition is to understand the design process behind all winning submissions. And that's why we have asked all 10 winners presented in this book a simple question. What made you win? So I'm so excited to get into this and just figure out what some of these people have said. There's a few interviews with others as well. I haven't actually flicked through this book myself, so this is my first reaction to it as well. But I just want to break it apart and try and get the best bits out of it to share with you guys. If it's anything like the last year, it's going to have 10 competitions in the book and the three best submissions from those competitions are going to be featured in here. I think he's added on this extra bit, so the author is going to explain what their reasons behind their design art and how they went about designing it to become a winning submission. So the book starts off with three inspiring interviews by architects who are in the profession who have done successful things. The first one is by Natalie De Vries. Um, just like last year I'm terrible at pronouncing names so I apologize in advance. Natalie is an architect and an urbanist from the Netherlands who I believe works for MVRDV which is a pretty pretty big firm. Some of the questions Marston asked Natalie is, is winning a competition a good time to start your own office? What was the first competition you took part in? Is there any specific design process you follow when starting a new project? And there are a few other questions as well. There's actually quite a lot of content based around Natalie here. And so I'm not going to go in depth into these interviews. You can purchase this book for yourself, either the ebook or the paperback like I've got and you can have it shipped to your door, but I'm just going to leave out the interviews because this video is going to be about the actual competition submissions. But just on that, if you want to know who the other interviewees are, it's Robert Coney... Oh, I cannot say that. No way, I'm not even going to try. But he is in this. The name will be on the screen. Ah, oh, he's the one that does By The Way House, which I actually posted on my Instagram a couple of weeks ago, which was finished in 1996. So that's pretty cool. And the final interview was by, I don't know, <laughs> I'm gonna try to pronounce it. Piotr, Piet, maybe it's Peter Kalinowski, Kalinow, Kalinowski. Peter Kalinowski, maybe. He's the owner of a young, fresh studio called Mixed, which is um, also pretty exciting. But let's get on, on to some of the submissions. The first competition I'm going to look at is the African House Design Competition, a home for the Jorajik family. Again, apologies, I'm not great at pronouncing. What's really cool about the book is that it gives you all the information about the brief that you need to know to then relate that back to the projects that have won. And you can look at how they've attempted to use the brief as a design tool to get their project looking as good as it is. So as you're reading through the book, you can look at the brief yourself 
and then think about how you would go about the design and how it's similar or different to what some of the winning submissions have done. Basically, the African House Design Competition is about the shortage of good quality and affordable housing in Tanzania. So obviously you're going to be looking at using cheap materials, cheap building construction methods in order to house the people of Tanzania. So the winning submission was by Mariana Castellari Giovanni Cecchia de Ambrosio from Italy. Yeah, I'm not even going to say names. I'm going to just show it on the screen. That's going to be a lot easier. So what they've done is they've come up with a solution that uses local materials implementing simple construction techniques, cross ventilation, thermal control, shading and water collection. And this is something that's actually going to be built. Once the fundraising process is completed, the construction of the proposal will start. So that's really cool. This is actually something that's going to be built. And so it obviously has to be pretty good. So the project aims at designing a suitable living space for the Jorajic family using local materials, implementing the construction process with self construction techniques and integrating the beauty of a simple design with solutions for improving the crossing ventilation, thermal control, shading and water collection. The house is designed around a courtyard, an open and protected space that can be shaded thanks to a wood pergola. The kitchen area, the storage and the water supply tank are facing north. Their south side gets all of the sun pretty much during the day and Africa being a quite a hot country, you're going to want to keep that cool during the day. So that's why they've put the kitchen area, the storage and the water supply supply tank facing north and they are contained by thick walls for better preserving food and water. That's what it's about. It's about preserving the water and the food so that it doesn't get too hot and dry out and then you have to throw it out because it's perished. The house walls facing south are shaded by a structure made by wood and local handmade carpets that becomes a geometrical and colourful decoration. You can see that the designers have actually considered quite a lot of the proposal um, they're even talking about using the compost toilet, a rocket stove, and they're just thinking about the overall life of the people that are going to be living there, which is the Jorajic family. So they're putting themselves in those shoes and thinking, how can we make life as easy as it can be? So their main drivers for the project is to be cross-ventilated, self-constructed, have water collection and use local materials. And it really is quite a nice looking facade on it. It's got that decorated brick motif. So generally it's quite a nice looking home. It's ticked all the boxes that the brief has been looking for and it sits nicely in its context. So that's why it's become first place and it's actually gonna get built down the track. So let's move on to second prize. This is done by the names on the screen. I'm not gonna read them out because they look even harder than the last ones, but well done to the three of you from Spain. So this is a project for people, a home for Africa. Since the beginning, we focused on versatility for this project since we aspire not only to satisfy the Georgic family, but many more throughout the continent. So they're thinking a lot further beyond just the Georgic family because really this is just a testing ground to create something that can be used throughout all of Africa rather than just the Georgic family. It's more of a case study house that can hopefully be replicated in and throughout Africa. Alvara Caesar actually says, if the man is ignored, architecture is unnecessary. And that's something that's driven this project. The two driving themes of this project was life and form. With life, they're talking about how the earth is still the primary way families put a plate on the table with food. So we decided to make that same earth the central spine of our building, which holds the whole structure together. After studying the habits of the Georgic family, they discovered that this home could not just be a house closed from the outside. It needs to be an element that bridged the gap between the outside and inside, giving them a gradient of closeness to enjoy the outside while also being protected from it. So the whole design is centered around this uh, acacia tree that inhibits their plot, creating a patio that functions as the heart of the project's life. The key thing to take away from this project is that they've just had two themes, life and form, and they've just run with it. The fact they've won second prize off of just pretty much two words, which is something I talked about in my last video, or the second to last video about concepts. Here is the exact process I use to stew up the perfect concept. Step one is distilling the brief. Really, you're trying to distill a brief down into just a couple of key words, one, one two or three key words and let that drive your project. And that's what these guys have done really, really well. So congratulations to them. 
on winning second prize. And here is third prize. I'm just going to show you some images of it because we cannot go through every single project. You can pick this book up yourself. As I said earlier, the link for that is in the description. I highly, highly, highly recommend picking up a copy because then you can actually go through this yourself and take away everything you can and need to know from this book. What's really cool is that they show honorable mentions and all the special honorable mentions that didn't quite win, but you can at least see what some of these people did and how they still got honorable mentions and you can actually take away some of maybe what they lacked to then see what the other projects were doing well so that you can compare the two and you can take that away for your own projects. But that's for your own time. You can go through that in your own time. Let's move on to how the first place people won that competition because that's what we really want to know. Knowing that the first winning project would have been built, they decided to focus on the technological aspects of the design. They spent a long time researching, trying to study all the most suitable and efficient construction, local techniques, the natural and local materials. They decided to look locally in Tanzania at some of the already existing architectural examples that were there to see how they can do things differently and see how they can fit into that context without disrupting the harmony that's already existing there. The wise use of resources and materials really drove them in this project. So what gets me the most is that they started with these really diagrammatic sketches for their concept evolution, but what they say here is that simplicity is not a way to find a short and trivial solution, but it can be the elegant synthetic outcome for a complex problem. That's quite, quite a big point because Simplicity doesn't necessarily mean short, lazy, easy. It, what it's saying is that it's really quite difficult to get something simple by distilling the brief down from this huge block of text into a couple of key words. What that does is that it helps you not only drive your project forward with it, something that's really clear and concise in mind, but it's made it a lot more easy to understand because of its simplicity, even though it's got complex nature behind its original ideas, by simplifying it into a couple of keywords, by simplifying it down into easy to understand design sketches, it makes it a lot more understandable, which is probably what helped it get first place because it was easy to be read, easy to be understood and easy to be built. So for the graphical output of the project, they say that they studied a suitable layout considering what we wanted to present. The panels don't have to show everything, but they have to present clearly all the design process. And they say that the panels speak for yourself. The jury is listening to you through the drawings. You don't have to speak about everything. All you have to do is just clearly showcase your thoughts on paper in your drawings so that they can be understood by others. A picture tells a thousand words. Let's move on to Fairy Tales 2020. This is the top entries that offer a tale of warning and hope during uncertain times. I think this was similar to the last year's competition where you had to tell a story through your architecture, which I quite enjoyed that competition. So I'm going to enjoy going through this one. Now, obviously this is going to be about COVID, I believe. The winners were chosen by a jury of more than 20 leading architects, designers, and storytellers, including Alison Brooks, Mark, I'm not going to say all the names because I'm terrible. But there were a lot of distinguished judges, which makes this quite an interesting competition. As our actual lives have become increasingly surreal, says jury member Mark Surumaki, principal at LTL Architects. The story's engagement of both the inherent darkness and optimism of the fairy tale became particularly resonant. This is quite interesting. The fairy tale challenge has attracted thousands of participants and winners have gone on to develop their stories into successful Kickstarter campaigns, short films, comic books, and exhibitions. The idea of this competition is to help architects get better at communication because that's what one of the owners of the competition says is fundamental for design. They say that good communication helps great ideas change the world. It challenges architecture to rethink its role in society by speaking about things everybody can relate to in a language understandable to all. So what is the first winning competition of Fairy Tales 2020? And that is The Year Without a Winter by Thomas Fisher and Carletta Cominetti. That wasn't too hard. Probably said it wrong though. 
Hungary, Italy they are from. So the way they've done this is that they've got a script and they've written a story that has helped come up with a proposal for the design, the architecture, through communication and story. I'm not going to read this whole story, but it's going to be cool to look at some of their images, and you can tell that the images themselves tell a story, which is really quite cool. There really is a lot of story in the renderings. I can imagine there'd be quite a lot of emotion in this story just as I'm reading through it. And emotion does drive good stories, so good on you guys because that is a great looking project. Very dystopian, and we will find out how they went about winning this a bit later. Second place was called Symbiosis by Alexander Sebotaryov and Laura Kursvietiet. I don't know. I don't know. That's hurting my head trying to read names. And these are quite dystopic Im imaginations of the future, I would say. Very futuristic stories that are being told. I love this idea of architecture being told through stories to create architecture. But I want to know how they won that competition because that's what we all want to know. So Thomas Fischer and Carletta Cominetti from Hungary, Italy have won this competition. How about did they do that? That's what we're going to find out. The fairy tales competition was the best opportunity for us to create powerful architectural images following the complexity of a real story. As 3D architectural visualizers, our goal is to represent a building that doesn't exist yet and create a lifeful rendering, working on lights, materials, and animations. Capturing a moment to engage the public and drive people through a story to better understand the design and architectural choice. So the first thing they did was try to figure out what that story actually was, and that's when they went with The Year Without a Winter. It's a story about isolation, about a humanity that has lost hope and motivation, and we wanted to talk about the near future and the extreme moment when you think, there's nothing left to do. They developed the narrative and illustration simultaneously, trying to balance words and images. They wanted to leave the readers enough freedom to wonder about causes and consequences, space and time. They try to describe the facts, raise doubts and questions without really giving any answers. So to represent the site and landscape, we took our time to find references and pictures, which is important to do to find precedence and inspiration before starting a project, to have an idea of what you're looking at creating and then actually putting in the time to create that. They mostly use photos we took during a Californian trip in the desert, which you can see here. Working on the atmosphere, it's always the most important part. It's the quality of the setting around us which evokes emotion. And as 3D artists, emotions are what we are always seeking to tap into. By using atmosphere in our images, we are more likely to create something that truly speaks to the viewer. So they've got this idea of isolation. So they've picked this environment of desert and sand and nothing for isolation. They worked on the colors and the light and sun reflections. Like a cinematographer, they chose a color scheme which is one of the first elements to communicate the message behind the design on both visual and psychological levels. So not just thinking about this is a building, this is a built form, but how do you represent it to have a story, to use cinematography to show different colors to create and evoke emotions? How do you go about doing that? Lighting is a key factor in creating a successful image. Lighting determines not only brightness and darkness, but also tone, mood, and atmosphere. They say that it's absolutely necessary to control, test, and manipulate, manipulate light correctly in order to get the best textures, vibrancy of color, and luminosity, especially in a situation where you need to capture and manage a huge amount of light reflected from the various parts of the scene. They decided to always have the sun in front of the camera. It contrasts and backlights to recreate disturbing sensations of a burning strong sunlight, a feeling of dread, anxiety. So once the work of setting and global scenery was done, they could then move on to start working on architectural elements, symbols and metaphors, the old car, the towers, the street, the water. The goal was a pure and simple composition where each and every element could pop out and create a different and individual sense of strength and meaning. Polluting air conditioning systems completely cover the facades of the buildings. People's activities and connections are reduced to the minimum and wobbly unsafe bridges are built to help keep the communication alive. Technically they decided to build the towers out of three very basic elements. Again, trying to distill a brief down into two or three keywords is basic, trying to simplify stuff, 
but not necessarily removing the complexity of it. This is really interesting. The composition in the five images was another important aspect of our work. The composition is the frame of the image, and how the elements of the mise-en-scene appear in it is a guideline that must be observed when telling stories visually. This is the most interesting part. The first images are structured on symmetry and rigid skin. They are purposely aligned with each other to have some sort of composition. For the final one, they break away from the symmetry and went for a free, thoughtless composition to let the viewer really feel the breeze, they say. The last competition we're going to look at is the Xi'an train station competition by the Young Architects Competition and Manny Group. In September, this was a call for ideas to design a multifunctional area in the Chinese city of Xi'an. By 2030, Xi'an will experience an expansion of more than 17 kilometers squared. It aims at maintaining the city as a hub of the relationships between China and the Western world. Therefore, this competition was created in order to create an international call for ideas to design a new railway terminal to further define the historical meaning point between East and West. First prize for the Xi'an train station was by Giovanna de Simone and Matteo Amicarella in Italy. Italy seems to win a lot of these. They, they're pretty good, I guess. They're pretty good architects. This is more my style of um, design. It's not just desert. This is green, which is nice because uh, the last few projects were all just isolation and desert and yeah, not nice. So, so a ring is the symbolic shape to link the several systems involved in the project. A ring is a symbol of union, connection, as well as an opening at 360 degrees to the world. They wanted to make an ongoing dialogue that focused on materials and the physical aspects of the design. The creators of this project look at creating a connection between sky and ground because between that is just mankind. This powerful meeting generates a green roof that refers to the mountain skyline of the Sichuan area, creating a beautiful succession of peaks and valleys that allows the visitors to approach the building on different levels. Each passenger approaching to the new Qian train station will be pushed into a big forest that has trees, plants, water, and these would be the first elements that they see when they step off of the train. I'm going to move straight on to how they won this project as that's what we all want to know. So over the last few years we have collaborated with some Italian studios that have important partnerships in China, which is why we were particularly interested in the theme of the Xi'an train station competition. The pre-design phase consisted of three different parts. First of all, they had to recognize the type of competition they were planning to participate in. They say that sometimes it's all about a great concept, whereas in other cases you need to copy with specific requests or technical details. Therefore, to recognize what's being asked of you first and what the competition is about is key into progressing forward. They say to pay particular attention to the brief. They say they usually read it several times, summarizing it by points or keywords, which is obviously what I've been trying to preach all video, that you wanna try and distill your brief into a couple of keywords to drive your processes forward. What are the client's intentions? They say that we often forget that behind a brief, there's a hard, long and complex work in which the clients have tried to synthesize and express all their needs, objectives and future visions. Surely it will be the brief itself to offer the first key to our project. It's important to read between the lines. The third part of the pre-design was team training. Obviously as an architecture student, if you're doing a project by yourself, you're not gonna have a team involved, but this is still important to listen to. Discussing with the others and sharing our knowledge is fundamental to obtain a good result. And it represents a precious learning moment. Working with different professionals, such as architects, engineers, landscape architects, designers, artists, as well as psychologists, art historians, they can lead to interesting design visions with unexpected implications. Getting your whole team on the one boat is going to be a lot easier than sailing off, leaving some people behind and they've got no idea what's going on. And that does happen quite often in group projects as you guys would know in architecture school. So the pre-design phase also consisted of research, ideas, and suggestions. So once they've clarified what they have to design, it is essential to understand where and when, which is, you know, key to any project. They believe that this is one of the most important stages of the entire process. 
so we really dedicate a lot of the available time to it. They really spend time researching the site, creating ideas and suggestions for the whole brief, thinking about the concept before getting into the technical nitty gritty parts of the design. Because then they move into the concept phase and this is may overlap with the previous one they say, in which it's good to write down every suggestion with sketches or notes. A real brainstorming means that there's no wrong answers, there's no bad notes or ideas that you can jot down. This is really interesting, they say that they spend most of their time in the concept phase for this competition, and they say that only in the last two weeks did they begin working on images and text for the panels. So if you're working on your concept all up all semester, all semester for your project and in the last two weeks you start to think about putting them onto panels, start thinking about actual drawings and renderings. That's pretty scary when you think about it. This is where a lot of us go wrong. They ask, how do we select the most correct idea? And of course they say there is no single way to come up with an idea for a building. Each case is different and sometimes the best concept comes from the most unexpected place. If there are no rules given to you in this sense, there's no construction requirements needed, then they create their own rules and then they try and create something or pick the best solution that is solving the problems of the rules they've created for themselves. That's a bit abstract, but really, if you haven't been giving a site in architecture school for a project, you know, the site is Fundamentally, it drives your whole design process. It tells you which way you should orient the building and how you should have glazing in certain spots. So if you create a site for yourself in architecture school, if you're not given the site, it's gonna help you create those things and it's gonna help you consider the best design solution based off of one of those rules you've created for yourself. So all of this led to the concept of the new train station. And there's a whole lot more they talk about, <laughs> like a lot more. They talk about then the design phase and the execution phase. And this goes over pages and pages, but I'm going to leave it at that because I'm starting to get exhausted and my head's spinning because it's so warm in here. My goodness. But thank you guys so much for watching. If you want to win a copy of this book, let's talk about that. The way you can go about doing that is by one, subscribing to the YouTube channel down below, two, liking the video, and then three, commenting down below that you want a copy of the book. Once you've done all three of those things, you can then get entered to win the book, which I will pick in a couple of weeks. I'm not too sure when, but you will hear about that over on the Instagram page where I'll be doing another giveaway of one of these books. And so stay tuned to my Instagram if you want to find out if you've won the book or not. Woo! I think we've done all right. My audio did die on me a bit there. But uh, we've done all right, I believe. This has been over an hour of me recording, going through this book. So as you can imagine, I'm quite exhausted hit it, sitting in my hot room. If you don't want to wait for the giveaway to end, which will be in a couple of weeks, then you can feel more than welcome to go and purchase this book using the link in the description below. And this will create an incentive for me to keep creating videos for you. So I appreciate you using that link down below. I really do highly recommend you get this book. There is so much to be learnt from it. There's over 200 pages and it is absolutely incredible. Thank you guys so much for watching this video and I will see you in the next one. I'm still working on the documentary that's coming out soon. If you haven't heard about that, stay following me on my Instagram page. Until then guys, take care and be well.